Hello and welcome. My name is Lisa McNett. I am the founder of One Breath Institute, and this is a roundtable discussion with the current leaders of One Breath Institute. I will introduce those leaders. We have Debbie Sherman, who is the co-founder of One Breath Institute. Debbie is in red. <laughs> we have Andy McNetz, another co-founder of One Breath Institute. Andy, please say hi. So the three of us are the founders of One Breath Institute. With us also are ISU. ISU is our assistant teacher and mentor. Thank you, Isu. And then Rachel is our mind-body integration specialist. Let's all take a collective breath. Yeah, so trigger warning. I don't normally give trigger warnings, but we are here to talk about something that's heavy. We are here to bring into the light. Well, it's already been brought into the light, but we are here to bring into the light our perspective, our understanding, and our perspective on a recent incident that has shook and is shaking the breathwork world. And my understanding is that there is a lot of con has been a lot of confidentiality around this subject due to the nature of it and due to the request of the women who were victimized. Women were victimized by Dan Brule. Dan Brule has named himself and has made a public statement. And so because he has brought this into the light, we are now here to talk about it on our end. And what we want to know, what we want to be known first and foremost, <clears throat> excuse me, is that we have so much empathy and compassion for the women who have had the courage to step up and speak their voice, even though they have spoken it under the the guise of confidentiality because they don't feel safe enough for this to come into the light. And we have so much empathy and compassion for all of the people who are still afraid to speak the truth about things that have not been effing right. Things that have abuses that they have experienced firsthand or who have witnessed. And so with that, we're just going to open up to a discussion. And I know everybody here has something or a lot to say about the subject. And so I will let whoever's ready to speak go ahead and jump in. Okay, so thank you, Lisa, for giving that introduction and just highlighting again, those who are hearing our voices and who are being triggered by what's happening in the breathwork world. We are here coming together not to replace voices, but to speak our own voice and encourage you and welcome you and invite you to share your voice with us in a confidential space if that feels correct and inviting to you. So we'll be sharing an email that you can communicate with us um, in support of your integration and process as things come and arise. Because as Lisa mentioned, and I'll just highlight it again, yeah, this, this abuse is in the breathwork world and it's being highlighted. And a bigger truth, a big truth is that it's been going on abuse and re-traumatization has been going on in the breathwork world in a variety of different capacities. And so coming together in One Breath Institute, we are consciously coming together to set an integrity standard, an ethical standard to be a safe space for all people. <sighs> Mm 
And so as someone who's been in the breathwork world for a fairly short amount of time and who was previously in social work, the social work realm for at-risk youth and children, abuse and neglect, I was surprised and also not surprised at what I was hearing, what was happening on so many different levels, right? And so, hmm, it's not okay. It's not okay to be an, ex an external authority figure that is claiming power over someone. And that can look like touch, that can look like uh, emotional, that can look spiritual, that can look telling someone to do something because it's to better them, right? So any form of disempowerment just trying to give some examples of what that may look like, right, is not okay. Piggybacking on that, in the statement that was made by Mr. Boulay, my mind gets all fiery just thinking about it and the words went out the window, but essentially, um, you know, he claimed ignorance. You know, he made a statement that he did not ask for consent before touching people, that he did not take into consideration personal boundaries of the women he was working on or working with one to one sessions. He did not get informed consent. He did not. Um, think about the power def differential, right? And so to say in a, in a statement, I didn't do these things, I was ignorant, right? Like I was ignorant, I love you, please forgive me. Like ignorance is unacceptable. Like if you, this person has been in the breath, like he says, it's like 50 years. Doing this He's for 50 years years he's the right. pioneer of breathwork right yeah 50 years pioneer of breathwork supposed to be showing the way and he's showing the way and claiming ignorance so calling out mr Rouet, that ignorance is not acceptable i went I had never, I mean, we we have used Dan Boulay's book, Just Breathe, in our trainings because it's a great little book on breathwork. I will never use it again. It is out of our curriculum. But I have never personally been drawn to work with him myself or to look into his, to, to train with him or anything along those lines. Now I know why. But so I was digging around on his website recently and see he uses some of the language, right? Like breathwork for trauma. And you cannot, like, there's so many alarm bells that go off. Like when somebody is saying that breathwork for trauma, breathwork for deep healing, but they are not, there's no informed consent. There's no talk in any of the trainings that he leads about appropriate touch about personal boundaries. And now in his statement, there, those things are going to be at the forefront of his trainings. And like, where have they been for 50 years? And nine months ago, apparently is when these um, abusers let their voices be known, let it be known what had happened to them. And in that nine month period of time, that is not enough time to rehabilitate yourself to the degree that, that you are an appropriate spokesperson for those things. So let's take a breath. Aisu, you had a great question before we hit the record button, and I'd love to hear that question again. Yes. So I was saying that 
if I was a person watching this outside that I'm not in breath work, but I want to learn about it, how would I approach to a school? How would I approach? I would go to a name that is being going around. So I would go to a name, to, to a brand actually. When, when the school, when there's a school, it's, it's like a brand. You go to it because, because I trust it, because that I will be taken care of. I will be learning the things, the tools that I need when I'm becoming a facilitator. So another thing when you were uh, speaking, Lisa, came to me is that this person is, uh, this leader or teacher is in this uh, community, is, in, is teaching for 50 years, and he's been doing trainings for 50 years. So if he is not aware of this touch, which is very sensitive, who is he training? How, what kind of qualities is giving to his students and those students are going to other uh, clients and how are those uh, facilitators treating other their clients so it's it's a chain reaction it goes one to another if <clears throat> so the person who is the founder of the school who is the leader at the top of the school is projecting their values to students. So if I'm a person who, do, who doesn't know where to go, how to find the person to trust, but I want to heal, I want to learn to breathe. It's not just, I had a trauma, I want to heal. It's I want to connect to those people. I want to get into that community. Which community am I going to choose? And I know other names that are not working with integrity, that are not doing their work ethically, but they're famous, but they're charging tons of money. So, yeah, that was my question. And I know there are a lot of people like that. There are a lot of people who are turning looking at the names, looking at the schools, looking at the curriculum of the trainings, and which one to trust? You know, I think that that's the first question that will pop in my mind. Thank you, I see. Let me take a breath, especially want to acknowledge, you know, what you shared about that leader that has been, that's trained probably thousands of people Right, and what are those facilitators doing? Right, the projection of that person onto all of those other facilitators. What what is going on out there? But coming back to your question, Debbie, I'd love for you to respond. Well, I just have to just say it. Dan's language is manipulative. And what's the intention? So when it comes to trust, our life, I'm saying our life, because everyone is born in a world of conditioning. We are all born in a world of conditioning. And if abuse and trauma is a reoccurring experience, emotional abuse, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, spiritual abuse, right? If this is a reoccurring experience, then it can be normalized. It can be conditioned onto that person in that experience. And so anything outside of that may feel unsafe, right? Because we are normalizing, we are creating safety as we grow, as in the womb and through infancy and early childhood of what safety looks like and if we only see and experience a condition of trauma and abuse and only experience we're being told that everyone except for ourselves has the answer for us then we're naturally gonna continue that pattern of looking externally looking for an authority figure 
that has that one pill or that one diet or that one breathing technique or that one modality that's going to be the saving grace for all of my life experiences and trauma and it's going to just magically boom in an instant the moment i do it be able to have me live a completely different life maybe that's the placebo effect okay and so when it comes to trust and bringing in you know lisa you mentioned earlier breath work for trauma there's a lot of schools out there that are claiming a stance in trauma and it really deeply saddens me it deeply saddens me because being critical of that what's the intention why are you claiming that okay what are you doing to support trauma release support embodied healing embodied self so how to trust a school how to trust anyone you may be a person that has had to some degree what i just mentioned i know i was and a key thing is yes what isu said what are the values of the community be a witness be an observation before you jump in allow yourself some time and grace to really feel through your senses and through a variety of different ways that information is coming to you right and then also ask yourself the question what is their intention what's their message do they have this one magic pill that's going to fix all of my problems? Is that a true possibility? Right? And usually that magic pill, like if we were to dive that in, that magic pill is asking you to surrender your power. It's asking you to believe in them as the guru or as some form of, um, I have all the answers that you seek right and and that is dangerous. It's dangerous because I know and what we stand in one breath Institute is that you hold all the answers you live in your body, you know your mind, you know your experiences, you know what your body needs whether or not you've learned how to trust that is different. Okay or love that or care for that is different, right? So to sum it up, when you are inquiring about any healing modal, anything actually, anything in life, when you are inquiring about more information of how to feel more amazing in life or to recover or to overcome whatever the language and the motive is, if that message or intention is a magical pill that asks you to surrender your power in any way, to any degree, you run the other direction because it's just perpetuating a cycle of always seeking outside, outside yourself. Always seeking outside yourself. And so inner authority, you have the power, you, you know, we may have a variety of tools, right? So this, I'm just using language that's true for One Breath Institute. They may not all be correct for you because you're unique. Your experience, your life is unique. And so just that piece. Um, and, and do yourself the service of time, observation, and research. You know, if you, so uh, I get, a, I get really emotional because, you know, I didn't realize coming to this school, uh, I still speak to Lisa, I didn't realize creating this school with you, Lisa, that we would receive so many people who have been re-traumatized by other schools and other leaders of the breathwork world. Like people come to us because they feel the power, like literally they feel the power, the connection and the consciousness and the embodiment of the breath. They have felt the breath breathe them and they have to overcome, recover from this trauma experience first before they can even trust the breath again. 
but they're curious because they felt the aliveness, they felt the whatever was needed for them. So I didn't know that. And our school has been alive in this realm for what, a year and a half? And I hear that people are just a number and people are, you know, realizing that the way that they're being touched is not okay or they come and connect with us and they're like oh this is what breath works about this is what healing feels like this is what presence feels like right because the breathwork world right they talk about presence they talk about consciousness they, it makes me mad. I get mad. Like, why are you throwing around consciousness? And then after, you know, 50 years, you say, oh, I just didn't even ask for consent. Oops, forgive me. Yeah, it's But like I'm a they, conscious breath worker. Yeah, it's like they have all the right buzzwords and they use all the right buzzwords and create kind of this facade with it, but they don't really put it into authentic practice or genuine practice so yeah it just creates a whole big mess yeah yeah and rachel i'd like to hear your voice if you feel available too just speaking about that like system piece and piggybacking with andy like before we started recording there was a question of like what more can be done here right and there's a lot that can be done and ultimately it comes down to the individual person. There can be systems in place, there can be consequences, there can be, you know, all of these different ways. Look at our system in society. There's all of these different ways, right? To um, come back around and say, oh, hey, this isn't okay. But what about the education? What about the pre-intervention? You know it's wrong. Why are you doing it? Like, that's it. It's like accountability. It's like, where's the account? How is this process person going to be held accountable? You know, is that possible to help hold somebody accountable to that sort of thing? And I'd like to think that it is, or that it somehow it can be possible to hold people accountable, more accountable especially with the current situation, I feel like there's, there's measures being taken, but it just doesn't feel like it's enough somehow. So. I'm really feeling like just recently um, here in OBI, in a session, uh, right? We had a student who is thriving in the personal journey, um, thriving and, and really doing the work, like pulling back layer after layer and looking at um, their behaviors, how they're showing up in the world, just really doing the work. And this person just got you know blindsided by this event in our society, in the breathwork world. Um, this is an example of how how Dan's um, position of or the abuse of his position of power and privilege has this trickle down effect that I Sue was speaking to. How it trickles down um, it, all the way over here. So if this originated in Mexico, let's say now we're all the way over here. All this time later, in our online breathwork community, our school, and here we are in session, right? And this person flat out is like, and they want me to read this book. I started this book. And so this, this person is now angry at one breath for suggesting reading this book as if we were supposed to know, we're supposed to vet every person we're suggesting, you know, the reading to. We're supposed to be the authority for the students, right? So this person is furious that we suggested that they have to read this book and that this person has already started reading this book. What a waste of time. What a waste of money. Fuck this book. To which I said, you're absolutely right. And fuck this book. Right there, there was like a settling, right? There's a settling. 
And I encourage this person to, if they feel called to write a synopsis about this book as per the assignment, write about that. Write about fuck this book. Write about the betrayal you feel from the, these words, these beautiful words and guidance in this book, and then trying to connect that to the reality of the person, right? Write about that because ultimately how this person receives this experience, right? This person is in a, in a vulnerable place, uncovering, discovering, rediscovering, in the personal journey, and you know, like everyone here has been through the personal journey, right? It's not easy. I see how you've been through a couple times, right? <laughs> right. It's not easy. So this person is walking the walk, right? Doing all this work and then boom, boom, boom. That's unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Yet all we can do at this point is support and empower our students, right? Support and empower and speak loudly and speak clearly that we're not going to accept or tolerate abuse of power, victimization, predatory behavior. We're not going to support that and we are going to speak up and out. So how, how that looked for me was in that moment, in that session, just encouraging this person, this student, to align with their inner truth, share their inner truth, and fuck that book. Fuck that book. Right? So that's like my little piece. That's like the little piece that I can do with what shows up for me to just show the arrive as somebody that is living in integrity. I always resource myself before I go in session with someone. Like that's what you have to do. The, the thought of somebody so well versed, right, in the world who doesn't even have the sense to fully resource themselves before engaging with traumatized people in this traumatizing world, that blows my mind. It blows my mind that this is happening. Like it, it sh shakes me to my core. Yet, I can be shook to my core and I can show up. I can show up for others, right? And through community, through consciously turning over our behaviors, right? Turning it over, assessing where we're at, assessing how we're showing up. We are responsible for how we show up in the world. We are responsible for how we show up in the world. I could go on and on and I'm feeling like maybe just <laughs> let me leave space for some more words. That's where I'm at with this. Yeah, I just want to take a breath. Because how many schools use that book, right? How many schools use that book? The school I went to used that book. The school I taught at before opening One Breath Institute used that book. How many schools use that book? And so you just brought in, like, you just brought in that whole other trickle down layer of all of our current and probably past students like across the board who have some level of mistrust of the school that they attended to who used that book. <laughs> right? And so my words just come right back to me of like ignorance is not okay, right? Ignorance is not okay. And this is a different kind of ignorance, right? Like we did not knowingly, right? Hmm. Like I would like to apologize to everyone who read the book, 
because we suggested it and because we brought it into our curriculum and is already out of our curriculum. Yeah, and it's like any book ever now, like we like like what's the source? I always with articles that I read online, like I I, I don't believe anything really, like especially politics or like I like I don't like I don't get easily swayed by anything unless I have first hand or like actual like I know I can trust this information, right? Like I know that I can trust this information. And so this just is a bigger concept for me of like peeling back the layers to every source of everything, because there is an energy connected to every source of everything. Debbie, I know you unmuted a second ago. Well, what we're doing is we're, we're um, rattling that energy dynamic right we're saying it's not okay on all levels we were removing the book we are doing thinking right hearing you process lisa and i'm in agreement like we get to now take what we know take this experience have conscious conversations and reevaluate the structure of our school or not the structure but just like what we offer like go down through but what i was really thinking of and what's just really sitting with me is just coming back to this wasn't the first time. So having some big realizations to everyone who's like wanting to still trust Dan, wanting to have disbelief as someone in the social work realm, speaking to all therapists, speaking to all social workers, all people, teachers, counselors that are of service and know the truth that when something comes to light it is not the first time it's just the first time someone gave a to pass along the information and listen to those voices it's the first time that someone said wow this isn't okay and started a different chain of reaction because he didn't get to the level that he's at without help and support Okay, and not putting blame to those people along the way, but shining light that when you see someone, when you hear someone, when you are experiencing someone do wrong, do not keep the book part of the school. Do not, not do anything, right? Because along the way, you know, it grows and people are having that, you know, I experience and I've heard it, I've heard it. So I know the inner dialogue, the inner dialogue's like, oh, wow, that doesn't look okay, but that person didn't say anything. I don't think that's okay, but I'm not gonna say anything because I'm uncomfortable and I don't wanna be the bad person or the B word, right? Or crazy because my experience is different from the one that they're letting be known. Right, because it's the one that's being let known. If you have a feeling that's like ugh, sticky, icky, ugh, you know, like I, for me, I feel it right behind the shoulders, and it makes me like stand up here. Um, and I just speak to that because, again, it's not the first time. So we opened up this space with inviting people who are now being triggered in their own experiences, their own inner questionings happening. Did this happen to me? Did this happen to my friend that I supported them after this experience? Right, all of those inner questioning, those curiosities coming to surface, they're there. And they're invited to be shared in confidentiality so that you can also seek support if that feels correct to you. So I was first speaking to, yeah, just that like chain reaction, right? When you choose nothing, or let me rephrase, when you choose absence of taking action, you are supporting abuse. You are supporting 
this. And that may not feel good. And that may, sh you know, shatter you and you may be feeling well that's not true i i honor and respect your experience of this one person maybe your experience and the ones who have been victimized that's their experience and it's equally real and it's equally true so you mentioned debbie you know, you brought in that piece, that truth that this doesn't happen overnight and it's not just a one-time occurrence and brought in those, you know, there are other people in the, in that person's field. There are other people who didn't speak up, didn't say something. And, you know, that's, that's a piece I really want to highlight and I really want to bring in because it is the foundation of our school. It is the foundation of One Breath Institute to regularly do your own inner work. And, and, and doing your own inner work doesn't look like me going off on my own and saying, I'm doing my own inner work and Debbie and, and Rachel and Andy and Isu all being like, great, Lisa. But not being able to call me out on something that doesn't seem right, right? Like, like a lot of these infrastructures, it's it, it, we did a podcast about this not too long ago. Debbie and I did a podcast on um can go back in uh, the dark side of spiritual communities is what it's called. You can go back and look on our website or on YouTube. I mean, this is across the board. It's just, you know, I hate to say that I was waiting for it to happen because it's in, it's happened virtually everywhere else. I was like, okay, when's it going to happen in breath work and who's it going to be? Because we don't have the strong regulation that we have. And so people can go off and we get, we get hit with that all the time. Like people, I don't want to take a nine month training or I, you know, now we're really going to that two year standard. I, I think we're not going to give the option to people anymore to even just do the nine month part. You have to be with us at least two years. Oh, I don't want to do that kind of a training. Can I just do a weekend workshop or can I just do like a two week or, or, or 12 week? Like, no, like, no, you can't. And there are so many people out there who are doing that, who are going, oh, I took this weekend workshop and now I'm a trauma-informed breathwork facilitator da, 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 and all kinds of bad happen. So I thought it was going to be, you know, some of that stuff coming to light. Not somebody who's been doing this for 50 years and who is the pioneer of breathwork, but that just highlights how much you need to have people around you who feel safe enough to say to you, Lisa, this is how I'm experiencing you lately. What's going on? And then I go, ooh, ooh. I'm going to sit in that discomfort, right? I'm going to sit in those feelings and I'm, we're going to work through it. And oftentimes people in these positions right? They're the shiny, flashy guru who everybody is praising, who can do no wrong. So you have to, we stress this all the time, and people have a hard time the higher they come up in our community because we keep putting it back on. You have to sit with your shadows. You have to, a tiny breach of integrity a tiny breach in speaking true doesn't necessarily mean you're going to go and sexually abuse people, but it's, it's a pathway of opening to bigger breaches of integ integrity. I'm going to take a breath. Lisa, related to what you shared about the uh, trainings of nine months and bring it to two years, I'm also questioning the, you know, intense trainings that are packed in, in a month, the all levels that you're going to get it all 
in this nice space in this is in this uh beautiful places around the world and you're gonna have it all we, we're gonna give you all and you're gonna be a breathwork facilitator and and that's just not real <laughs> that's not real you cannot become a i mean we're humans we're humans and we make mistakes just like we have to go over the personal journey over and over we're le learning i am learning a part of me and learning the process also so this cannot be thought in a very short period of time and yes you may have the certificate a person may grab the certificate and return home and then start the job that they're dreaming and they can make it money whatever they want but it doesn't happen that way it doesn't it doesn't it's not that quick it's not that easy and there's no shortcut to it there's no shortcut to it. So this is, I think, what the leaders, teachers, or everyone uh, seeing the value of the process, you know, honoring the process that it may, it takes time, it needs time. It's just the uh, nature of it. <laughs> Just hearing you, I sue comes back to like the journey of life, the intention of life. Like, cause really, really what I witness people do is it tells me how dedicated they are to themselves ultimately. And there's no true right or wrong. However, it comes with intention. If you have intention specifically to be trauma informed, to hold space for others, to be empowered, to be liberated, to be a conscious, embodied, safe space and support that. The time it takes is how much you're willing, right? How much you're willing. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it's not, I mean that 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 sparkle, right? That glitter in the world, the glitter part. I was using this analogy or metaphor analogy. The glitter when something's super shiny and perfect, it's probably just trash. It's probably just trash. It's part of that conditioning. It's part of having that pill. It's part of having that. And there's no there's no wrong in wanting that goodness what if I could just snap my fingers and everything goes away. It would have already been that way you wouldn't be seeking for breath work if it was already that glittery and perfect. Right like the calling of breath work is life. I experience it to be different than many other modalities, because it is literally life itself. You don't get to know life, your life, and a weekend glitter, you know? And so at some point, I would like to hear again, if you feel available, Rachel, like what you would like to see moving forward after, yeah, Andy, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to quickly say that, you know, most people don't realize that it's more about their own healing work than it is about others. That's through their own healing work that will be, um, you know, tr transmitted or, you know, um, carry over to others that, but that's going to be coming from their own work that they've done to themselves, done for themselves and with themselves over a long period of time, layers, layers don't come off in a month, layers, layers, maybe half a layer comes off in a month, but then there's a hundred beneath that. And at what point are you, do you have enough layers? Have you worked through enough layers that you can be a facilitator of healing of somebody else, you know, at their, on, at their point on their journey, you know? So it's just, yeah, I just wanted to just, you know, emphasize that. That's all I just felt inspired to emphasize. So.
Yeah. And the, the shiny glitter part really for this is that now we have like an opportunity before us. We have a huge opportunity. Like we see this area of darkness and we're all ready to shine our light, right? So there's like an opportunity for us to really come together and create a new foundation. We can create a new foundation with um, breathwork being like the best healing modality you've never heard about yet. And that will be an article, so stay tuned. But we are like on the cusp of um, breathwork really moving more into center stage with regard to the, um, the healing benefit and the, the different ways that this can be woven into all types of other healing modalities. Um, so we're, here we are, we're arriving at this new birth, right? This new birth of what this could really be. It's true intention. And like we can envision um, a more regulated breathwork situation. Like we can envision, um, and when I say like regulation, like I don't like regulation. I don't like the need for oversight because I really resonate more strongly with personal integrity, right? But I don't know that many people with that much personal integrity. I don't know. Let me just say, I don't know a lot of people like myself who is constantly looking at, well, how does this affect another human being? What is my blind spot? Right? And that's a mindset. That's a learning. And we're all capable of achieving this. It's just not many people um, see the benefit in caring about how they show up in the world. But here we are on a landing point, really, where we can make this exactly what it's intended to be this vital life force healing opportunity, right? Unencumbered by the bullshit. We can create a board, a regulating body that is not too masculine, right? Because for me, this is a, a female issue for me. We could have more balance in um, like who serves on a board, who regulates, how do you become someone who gets to wear that position of privilege and power for a short time, a term, a year, you know, which then you go before your people again and get voted back in or not. Or maybe you don't get to serve continuously because if we're doing this right, we are constantly birthing more leaders and we want to step out of the way so that the new voice can speak through. Leadership isn't about being in the front. Leadership is about compassion and amazing listening skills, <laughs> you know? taking the temperature of the room before you engage, which clearly Dan is not able to come through in that regard anymore. So this is just a time for removal of the old. And this is also showing up in our greater society, you know, with people speaking up against abuse of power. So, and how this trickles down into sex when this type of stuff, it's not sex, it's just perpetrated sexually, right? And we, like, we don't have to live like this anymore. So we have an opportunity and I guess like that's what this is. We're coming together, we're speaking openly, right? We're staying in fact, but we're also addressing feeling because you know, the mind and the body has to work together, right? We gotta work together. We have this beautiful opportunity to create a world really where the victims of abuse don't feel that they need to hide away in confidentiality, right? Which just paves the way for predatory behavior. So like we have this opportunity right here. 
I'm, I'm deeply grateful that I have one breath as my, as my guidepost, as my leaning pillar, as my rock, because I know that we tend to um, share the same uh, resonance when it comes to justice and social inclusion and like what it really means to be impartial and in resonance with somebody's experience in the moment, right? So while this is absolutely awful, there is an element of yay, yay. We see things more clearly. Now let's adjust and let's let new leadership emerge and let's take this to the next level. Let's, you know, meet with our behavior, this opportunity that we have. That's where I'm at. I hope I spoke to what you were thinking of, Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and and it's just beautiful that you always answer in presence. And it it shifts and changes, but the message was very clear to me. Yeah. Andy. Yeah, I was gonna just just off what Rachel said, like, yeah, it's like at least we know that like we see the tip of the iceberg, but at least we know there's iceberg there. You know, it's like, okay, now there's, okay, there's the iceberg. Now, how do we handle this? Or how do we, um, you know, what do we adjust now? Or how do we go about, you know, doing what we can to continue to like evolve and, and improve the situation? So, yeah. You know. Well, let's take a breath. Yeah, that breath felt like it wanted some silence and some space for some silence and some space for everyone who is experiencing feelings and sensations around this and particularly the people who have been victimized. So the invitation that Debbie made is there for anyone who wants to share your story. It doesn't have to be about Dan Boulay. It can be about any story, anytime, anywhere, something that you've been holding, something that you've been carrying that has been choked back. You are invited to write to us. The email address we'll give you is team with O B I. So that's T E A M with W I T H O B I at gmail.com. And I foresee, I, I foresee. I foresee a lot of things coming um, from us, but that invitation is there and one of us will respond to you. Debbie, I see you, Rachel, Andy, any final words? Maybe in that order, Debbie. Well, you opened with a trigger, trigger warning because I know that the words and the frequency of what was shared today will awaken and shatter and shine light to some things that are uncomfortable, right? There, you may, as a listener, literally be having some physical reactions to this. And I want to introduce that it may feel like resistance, right? 
I'm, I'm here. My intention is just to put a pressured stance that's always felt, that's always grounded, an intention of safety. And that feels very alive and needed. And it's something that I'm available to give. I feel complete and I, I really hope that for those who are listening, and I already know the energy is doing what it's needing to do, and it's meeting people and maybe other leaders of schools. May you feel this pressure of safety and how we receive and set the standard for safety. And may may you feel pressure to make whatever necessary changes feel correct to you and to be another powerful pressured stance. We'll go next founder, Andy, any final words? Um, I just feel grateful to be part of a team and a school that I really feel is alignment with true integrity. And um, this doesn't just use it as a buzzword or not understand, you know, the value and, and the, the importance of, of it all. Um, I feel just grateful that, um, that, uh, yeah, that we, that we have an understanding, a profound understanding of what it, what it is and what it means and that we can be a shining and guiding light to other people or maybe other schools that maybe um, feel like, you know, they could maybe do a more comprehensive job or, of that or, um, yeah, I just feel, I just feel grateful to be, to be part of this, this community and this team. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, lastly, what I want to say is when it comes to ethics and boundaries, it is clear. There is no maybe in ethics and boundaries. It's clear. If you see any foggy statements in a school that you're approaching that you don't understand what ethics and boundaries are, then that means it's not clear. And that is the first step of, of any training, any training. It doesn't have to be breath work because there are other healing modalities which are going through this same stuff. So understanding ethics and boundaries at the beginning and from what I understand, they must be clear. They must be set out to the table clearly. Thank you, I see. Rachel, final words? I'm really, I'm thinking like, of like that old saying of like, um, you can choose to be part of the solution or part of the problem. And if you're not choosing to be part of the solution, you're by default part of the problem. So I really just resonate with um, checking myself each step of the way. Am I resonating with the solution or the problem? And I would really like to invite um, others in a, a leadership role either through their breathwork 
school or their breathwork practice to really embody in a moment to moment basis, are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? Understanding as what Debbie shared, you know, if you don't know what you don't know, right? If this is all you know is victimization, you're likely going to be pulled towards people who are going to victimize you without even understanding that dynamic. So a place like One Breath, where we put so much focus, especially straightforward from the beginning with, you know, are you safe? Do you feel safe? Do you understand safety in your body? Are you showing up in the moment? Or are you dissociated? Are you leaning into drugs? Are you running away from your life? Like right from the start, we're honing people into where are you? Are you making conscious choices for yourself? And that piece is really needed to be able to embody solution work. So I invite everyone to step into a place of solution. I feel like that is an appropriate place for us to close with that invitation to step into a place of solution. Ooh, and then it was like, okay, also safety, that safety piece that you brought in, that regular check. What is safety? Where am I? How present am I? How much am I choosing to be connecting with the reality so that I can be in a place of being part of the solution, right? Because I can be disconnected or dissociating and come up with ideas that I think are great, right? So just coming back to where, where am I? Where am I? How embodied am I in my presence and aware of the reality, not just of my situation, but the reality? So that I can be part of the solution. So let's all take a collective breath. And we have so many email addresses. So if you have another one for us, yes, you can connect with us that way. And we're giving team with OBI at gmail.com, T-E-A-M-W-I-T-H-O-B-I at gmail.com as an invitation for whatever wants to come through to us. Right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.